Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode, we speak to Carla Keretz about nutrition and mental health from a dietitian perspective. Carla, welcome to the show. We're really glad to have you on board. And um, yeah, so she has did an amazing job at, at getting another amazing guest. Um, welcome on board. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And it is a privilege to share my heart and passion for the subject matter today with everyone. Perfect. Um, so Shaz, how did you um, go about getting Carla on board to talk about nutrition and mental health? Because it's actually quite a, you know, we normally speak to psychologists about mental health, but it's actually amazing to speak to someone on the more, the nutrition part. And, you know, it's something that I suppose most people can control to some extent. Um, so actually, it's quite a interesting story. So I sent out an invite to an existing client of ours on our digital assistant program. And, you know, Charles came back and kind of said to me, listen, he doesn't really have any time at the moment, but would we mind if he asked any of his colleagues? And I was like, sure, no problem. And then Carla came back and said, you know, she would be very interested in being on the show. And that's when I sent her the invite. Thanks for agreeing. That's amazing. So maybe uh, let's kick it off and say, um, so how do you how do you normally work with your clients at the moment? And and can you tell us a little bit about why you're so uh, passionate about nutrition and mental health? Perfect. So basically, I um, have two legs of practice um, that I'm currently giving my attention to. The one um, leg is being in a stereotypical dietetic private practice. Um, in the east of Pretoria, so we um, focus on, you know, um, gut health disorders, weight loss, um, and, and all of the other um, nutritional um, um, things that you can imagine one goes to see a dietitian with. But then I got involved with Evexia Day Psychiatric Hospital, and that is where things get interesting. So uh, my responsibility at the centre is to run two adult groups um, in the in the week, and then we also run a teenager program where I um, attend to the teenagers' lunch every day. So every day from twelve to one, I will be cooking with them and discussing how food relates to how they feel and how they engage with the world, and just noticing the difference um, before admission and after admission, and the feedback that you get from patients really got me interested in the space. And um, I'm quite outcome-based. So the outcomes that 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 you see are really, really positive and that keeps you going as a professional. That sounds amazing. So so it's not just telling people, you know, what they should be eating. You actually almost like practicing it with them um, so so that they actually get it. That's actually quite unique. I don't think I've ever heard that before. you know, my wife's a clinical psychologist, and she worked at uh, Tara Hospital for a while and mm-hmm. in the eating disorder ward. And, you know, normally they would almost prescribe to, you know, to the patients what they can eat and what they can't eat. But uh, it's actually interesting that you say you actually, you know, work with food with them. I think that must be amazing. And uh, mm-hmm. do you have, like, the types of responses you get from your clients? What do they normally say? So, um I think we all have a set idea of what a dietitian do and what you can expect from a dietitian. And um, we all have a different relationship with food. And you already mentioned eating disorders and disordered eating patterns. For those who are struggling with that, when I walk into the room for the first session, I think one might be a bit scared or apprehensive about chatting to a dietitian. Is she only going to talk about weight loss? Is she going to be very critical on what's on my plate, like what's going to happen? And then when I realize that I'm not here to judge, I'm here to inform, here to guide, here to work with what you have. And I always start off by explaining that it's easy to sit on this chair and tell people what to do for a living. It's one thing to apply the guidelines yourself, and I'm a human just like you. And when we get on that space, then one can really have a, a conversation that that's worth having. So the, the, often the um, the first question would be, but why is a dietitian at the psychiatric center? Like, why is the sessions even scheduled in my program? But that question is hopefully answered by the first hour that I realized that 
we talk about, a lot about self-care, self-care in different settings from occupational therapy, obviously to the psychological sessions as well. And I believe um, I have a, a role to play there in checking the physical self-care part as well, um, because nourishing yourself and taking care of your body is really an act of self-care. I, I must admit, I did also have that question when I thought a dietitian at a psychiatric center, but the more I looked at it, the more it seemed to make a lot of sense that nutrition, yes, from a self-care point of view is you know, very good, but from a mental health point of view, you know, how does good nutrition actually help with somebody from a mental health state? So... Actually, when you look at the brain, the brain weighs about 2% of your body weight, but it uses about 20% of the nutrients that you consume. So just that simple fact alone, and again, put the emphasis on how important nutrition actually is when it comes to how the brain function. Also, when you just look at the effects of medication, the effects of um, psychiatric medication on appetite, we, uh, we, we um, struggle a lot with um, lack of appetite, um, encouraging um, intake, um, really, really important. And then also um, what is important is um, just in terms of structure and routine, how food can, can fit into that. Because when you struggle with depression, the last thing on your mind is having the shopping list and, you know, preparing meals and talking about blueberries and how healthy they are. That's not the way you are. And I always like to explain it by means of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think we, we all know to what I'm referring to, where your baseline need is having a roof over your head, food just to survive. Those conversations about eating perfectly, that's high level thinking. And that's thinking when you have enough resources in your cup. So what I try to do is also provide suggestions on how to enlarge your cup and, and also to see, but what, and it's sort of like a circle where nutrition makes you feel better and you tend more to your nutrition when you feel better. So it, you sort of get a positive snowball rolling. Um, and, and, and it's really, I always say nutrition is a complementary therapy. I became a dietitian because I'm passionate about food and the role that it can play, but I'm under no misconception that it is the one and only answer for mental health by no stretch of the imagination. But for all of the other therapies that you do, nutrition just puts everything into overdrive. It's like the super, super power that, that you put under the engine, the rocket fuel, that just makes everything more effective that you do. That is so amazing, hey! I mean, like, uh, I love, <laughs> I love how you got into that and said, you know, like from a, and and I think you're probably the first practitioner that mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, uh, that's actually so interesting that you mentioned that. But you're completely right. If someone is starving, I mean, you never, you know, the, you know, they're basically in fight or flight, and uh, it's only once you actually, you know, go through those levels that you actually start getting the consciousness part that you're talking about. Um, but I'm also glad that we're talking how interlinked that is, because I think that's the one huge thing that we're trying to get across, you know, with the, these episodes is that it's not, you know, and, and you probably experience this better than anyone else uh, from, from, a, you know, from the setting, because I think in the clinical settings, they do it better. You know, it's always in a multidisciplinary type approach. Whereas mm. if you go to see a dietitian just, you know, in a private practice down the road, you, know, you probably don't get that same feel. And I think I do like that, you know, that clinical aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I like that. And I like the link between mental health and that. Um, I do want to ask about the depression part. So from a depression mm -hmm. perspective, so what do you normally find with clients around their diet? Is it that they just don't want to, to eat well? Or is it that they can't? How do you, how do you normally see that? Okay, so the, the first thing that we um, check up is um, quality. So the, the first thing you would want to evaluate is the quality of a person's diet. And often when you are depressed, there's a lot of reliance on fast foods, takeaways, more processed foods for ease and convenience. Lots of times people who are burned out, um, burnout often leads to depression, and that's also due to a more of a time constraint um, lifestyle. So that again, leads to the same eating behaviors of 
um, reliance on um, on instant um, solutions and and fast food meals. So immediately I will check the micronutrient balance. And the one thing that stands out is vitamin D. Now I know vitamin D will come up in conversations about COVID and COVID risk as well. Um, but with mental health, I want to say for 80% of our patient population, we do the blood work and we find out that they have a vitamin D deficiency. So the, the first thing that you also don't do when you're the best is you're not outside tending to the garden or walking the dog. You uh, tend to be more closed off um, in, in your home or in your bed. So immediately vitamin D deficiency is extremely important for me to correct. Also, unfortunately, a lot of the um, uh, foods that would be advised for depression that uh, I'm, I'm specifically referring here to omega-3 rich foods are quite expensive. If I speak about salmon, avos, olives, nuts, those would be typical food sources that are really the superfood for the brain, but you must might just have someone sitting in front of you and saying, okay, Carla, it's a very nice theoretical conversation about what I'm supposed to be having, but I'm not buying your food. So I specifically allocate a slot to discuss what can I do in terms of a budget? Um, when, how can I obtain these nutrients in, in, in an affordable way? So when it comes to depression, obviously, there might be um, impact on, on, on work. So a lot of people might just have lost their job. So they're really concerned about budgeting and adapting to a new way of living. So that plays a big role in terms of diet. And then also um, the, the, the rest of the family. So a lot of pressure, especially if you are a single mom, maybe with three children, and, and you are suffering from depression currently, the stress about how this affects the, the, the nutrition of the rest of the family, they will ask me, I don't have um, the energy to feed myself, never mind my three kids, what can I do? So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's all different kinds of scenarios that can play itself out. So you got my curiosity going. With, so how would you get those nutrients in an affordable way? So, for example, um, with vitamin D, one thing you can do is you can take mushrooms. So a supplement will cost you about 200 rand. Maybe not everyone can afford it. So you can cut up mushrooms and slice it, put them in an oven tray, leave them in peak sunlight for eight hours, and they can actually activate the natural vitamin D in mushrooms 40 to 50 times. So, for example, that might be an add-on if someone can say there's nowhere that they can afford a vitamin D supplement. That's something we can do there. Of course, sunlight exposure is free. So just sitting and eating your lunch outside for 10 to 15 minutes. So, so the vitamin D one is quite easy to fix. Yes, the healthy fatty acid options, you're looking at sugar-free nut butter. So like a sugar-free peanut butter would be definitely something something to add. And then also like tuna and pulchets. Um, your your tinned fish fish options um, would be something um, to contribute as well if if, if um, the other options are not available to you. Hmm. That's actually amazing. Oh, I, I, I didn't. Uh, that's the first time I've ever heard the mushroom spot. So, do do you do you have a blog or something? I mean, do you put this information out, or is it only uh, for Evexia clients that you have? Um, how, do, how does someone get access to this information, maybe? That's what I'm asking. Would they set up an appointment with you, uh, or do you provide the information in any other way? So I actually have a Facebook page, um, Carla Harrod's Dietitian, as well as an Instagram page where I like to share this um, information as well. At Evexia, I'm part of the team, so I don't do any of the admissions or see any individual clients there. Um, so it's, it's like a hospital setting. So um, for follow up or um, for um, any anyone that would like to see me individually, I would I would um, see them at my um, harsh Fontaine practice, where we can still focus on an individual basis on mental health and nutrition. Although the scope there can obviously be much bigger. Ah, okay, cool. We we definitely gonna gonna link to that. Um, so that anyone listening to this will, will, you know, get those nuggets of information that you just mentioned. Um, I want to ask with the, you know, with the, um, with the nutrients that you mentioned or the, or the vitamins, uh, you know, vitamin D, there was a talk some time ago around, well, not talk, but, you know, it started to become a thing around whole magnesium. Is that mm -hmm. quite a big um, vitamin supplement that you also recommend? Absolutely, because especially a medication like lithium, 
uh, medication that a lot of um, our patient population would be on would actually deplete the same receptors that your um, magnesium works on. So you need twice the amount of magnesium. Actually, um, we had a talk yesterday at a conference for dietitians in Johannesburg that actually touched on mental health and nutrition. It was again emphasized that magnesium is is, is so so important um, to check up. Not only do you do the to the um, medication usage, but also where do you find magnesium in your green leafy vegetables? Not something a lot of people are fond of. So um, again, just it's just really really important to emphasize the nutrient as well as vitamin B12. So what tends to happen is that um, there's also a link between depression and um, being overweight. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. One can draw a whole scheme on how everything is intertwined. One lack of sleep, if you don't sleep properly, then um, that leads to weight, to weight gain due to a lot of physiological reasons as well. Um, so a lot of them are also on glucophage, for example, and, and, and uh, a medication for type 2 diabetes, and that affects the, how much vitamin B12 you need. So if you're on glucophage, for example, you need again, a higher dose of vitamin B12 supplementation. So it's a very individualized, and I must um, but the disclaimer here, obviously, when it comes to a dietetic in, in, um, evaluation, it really depends from person to person. But there are some things that we are on the lookout for when we um, look at individual nutrients. Omega-3, like I already emphasized, extremely important. We know that antioxidants can play a role, like vitamin C. And then one can get into a whole discussion about ADD and ADHD as well. Um, you, um, we see that at our, at our center as well. And then you can speak about the role sugar plays, even preservatives and colorants. So I'm sitting with a group in front of me who may have bipolar disorder or attention, um, hyperactivity disorder, a lot of different things, and they all have different needs and, and, and points to touch on. Mm, I really like that. So I like what you said as well in terms of the, you know, like almost a knock-on effect. You know, like you might be overweight because and then get depressed, or you might be depressed and then get overweight. But it's actually so interesting, you know, around that. I know from a personal experience point of view, you know, like uh, after I hit a certain age, I just like put on a few kgs. And like once I got my sleep right, and I started taking magnesium. But once I got sleep right. It's almost like the weight part, you know, sorted itself out. It was like quite interesting to notice that. And I noticed yeah. like once, you know, once it, like my sleep goes kind of out of pattern, then I do put on like a kg or two. I mean, like, you know, it seems to be normal. Uh, but at least knowing that, you know, would, you know, spark some discussion. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll definitely resonate with what you're saying now, uh, because mm -hmm. I think it is all interconnected. Um, so in terms of... Um, working with clients do you normally come up with a plan with them um, in terms of like this is a diet that you need to follow and is that dependent then on on each of the clients is that how it works yeah so we started from a group discussion and then and the team will identify patients that need a bit more intensive education on this on a specific um topic not everyone who's sitting in front of group nutrition might not be their sole focus or the, um, or the primary concern at the stage, or I might not yet be ready for that conversation. So what sometimes will happen is maybe only in week three or week two from admission, um, yeah, um, we will decide, okay, now is a good time for a conversation. Um, the patient has addressed a few issues now and can, 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 um, attend to this. So, um, but in a, in a group setting, I obviously go through what I call nutrition 101. So I will basically try to evaluate where each and every person is, um, try to, what I say, spring clean the diet also, and agreeing on a few fundamental principles. Because there's lots of different lifestyles one can follow, and lots of different dietary patterns, and different things work for different people. So there are certain things that are common through all of them, like drinking enough water, like having enough vegetables like having protein no matter what type of protein we can all agree we need some protein diet so i kind of find a common ground and then what i like about the group setting is each one of the patients will then share some insight and input on oh i do this with my chickpeas 
oh, that sounds amazing. I add this. And then it becomes like a whole debate on who makes the best chickpea soup, for example. And people learn from each, from each other. So, um, yeah, it, it's actually quite amazing. You know, Carla, I loved what you said earlier about you don't always immediately start with the nutrition, especially with somebody who is having, you know, when they're in a clinical setting, they're obviously at potentially their lowest or their worst. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you wait until they're at the right point where you can now start introducing the conversation. And the reason I say that is, you know, my, my partner has bipolar and anxiety and so, you know, then it's the one extreme to the other. Okay, we exercise seven days a week for half an hour. And then it's, and I realize, I've started to also realize I can only bring up the topic of, okay, maybe we need to look at the diet when she's in the right space. Because if I was to say to her tonight, okay, listen, we need to cut this out, it, it would not go down well. And that's obviously dependent on the mental state. Yeah. Um, but are there any foods that kind of could almost specifically help with something like anxiety or depression, or is it just more a case of, you know, having a well-rounded diet? I want to say there is more of a concept that is important in specific foods, and the concept is low GI. Okay, so what happens is the body does not like blood sugars raising and falling to very extreme degrees. And when we think about high GI blood glucose regulation, you immediately think type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes. But actually, when it comes to mental health, stable blood glucose levels are of extreme importance. So my aim then is to educate on good quality carbs. So that will be my first thing. Um, chatting about what good quality carbs are, their distribution, how you need them, how much um, of them you need, and how they can be equally distributed through the day for energy levels. Because what you want to do is you want to create momentum for um, supportive therapy and just general health in the right direction. And energy gives you that momentum, physical energy, by um, and, and by fixing um, the diet to a large degree, you attain to the energy level issue that, 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 that is a really big big part of this conversation. Um, we also know that protein um, in its most simplest form is amino acids and amino acids both neurotransmitters. So without enough protein in the diet, you cannot produce serotonin, dopamine. So it's really important, especially with eating disorders, where a lot of times you will find someone with an eating disorder starting off by saying, I'm a vegan or a vegetarian diet, and I'm by no means saying everyone that are following a vegetarian or vegan diet has, has an eating disorder. By no means am I saying that. But oftentimes it, it, it's a bit of a clue in, in, in disordered eating habits for some. So then I would really investigate that and try to evaluate protein-rich foods that can build these neurotransmitters. Um, our legumes are of extreme importance when you're following more of a plant-based approach. So beans, peas, lentils, already mentioned chickpeas. Um, those will be very important. Fiber is very important because we haven't even yet touched on the, the gut-brain axis, right? Where a, a lot of a lot of the, the guts working is so important here. And where, where do you feel anxiety? I always explain it like when you are waiting to do your prepared speech at school and the teacher is asking who's going to come up next and you're afraid she's going to call your name. You feel it in the pit of the stomach, right? You feel anxiety in, in, in the gut. So a lot of conversation is about bloating and and constipation and, and even diarrheal management. What... Uh, and, and obviously the link between irritable bowel syndrome and, and mental health um, is, is, is also very prevalent. But, when it, but to, to a long answer to a very short question, actually, there's no specific foods that I can say, listen, this will, ma this will magically help mental health, but it's more of a, 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 an overall approach that's important with a few key principles that does help. Hmm. I think uh, I, I like that answer. And I think also... 
I mean, uh, I think people are so varied as well, you know, in terms of, you know, different lifestyle, different culture, all of those things that almost like, you know, what you want to prescribe is not something that's uh, going to be a complete shock to the system. You almost like want to work with, you know, what they have and then kind of, uh, and I found, you know, we went to a few dietitians, you know, during, you know, various times, but yeah, they always seem to work really well around that, you know, saying, okay, you know, you do eat a lot more of this. Let's see how we add maybe a little bit of this and, you know, that should be, you know, that should work. You know? And I really like yeah. that from dietitians. Um, I do want to ask, I mean, I'm a firm believer in the whole intermittent fasting. And initially when I broached the topic, you know, it, it seemed to be, you know, quite taboo. But now it seems to be more mainstream. Do you have a view on it? I mean, again, you know, huge disclaimer, you know, nothing, you know, it shouldn't work for everyone. But uh, I'm curious, what's your take on that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually going to move to my private practice a, a bit more um, when it comes to weight management, where weight management is more the focus. Yes, we do apply intermittent fasting successfully for the right candidates. Who's the right candidate? So first of all, I must say, and there's some research supporting this, but I actually started to compare the results um, um, between women and men. And the men seem to be much more successful with intermittent fasting than women. And I was very interested in that, like, why is this happening? Because we work with a lot of couples. And then both would like to try the same thing, and, and the guy would do very well, and the woman not. And then it seems like there's actually like an estrogen protective effect against fasting. Um, so it, it seems like it works better for men by far than for women. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the, the second thing is, the question you always ask before approaching any routine is, can I do this for the rest of my life? Now, I know a lot of parents will say, but my son never ate breakfast at high, uh, during his school years. He, I, w- I always should have forced him to eat breakfast. It was never his thing. And then he sort of forms a natural pattern. While um, if, if breakfast is like your most favorite meal of the day and you cannot imagine even skipping breakfast, then don't force yourself to do it. You you get you get different patterns of intermittent fasting as well, right? You get the eight sixteen where you have two meals and a snack in eight hours time fasting for six. You can choose your eight, eight own eight hours. Um, it can be from breakfast till just after lunch, and then you can fast from then till next breakfast. So it need not be from lunch to supper. Um, but it, again, very personalized. Um, can be a bit um, triggering for those with a poor relationship with food as well. Um, but it, it definitely has a role to play. And there are studies that have good outcomes in terms of especially um, blood glucose management. Okay. I like that too. I'm going to reference this. But <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, I was one of those people that yeah, I never liked breakfast until I met my wife, and then she loves breakfast. So it was like a whole routine, you know, about having breakfast. Uh, and I wasn't even a morning person, so then I had to wake up early and then also have breakfast. I mean, like you know, it was like a double double shock to the system. But um, because I see, I mean, and again, you know, like that's the part, you know, with information online is you can never get credible sources. But I see, you know, there seems to be two camps. You know, one one is where they say fasting is really bad for the system, and it almost like I don't know shocks the body and it's bad for the body long term. I just know for me, I mean, I feel better with it. So I don't know. Um, I'm never sure, but, you know, like I, I do it because I like it. So yeah. it seems to work. You know, the intermittent fasting with coffee in the morning seems to be a trick. Um, but I did find, I mean, the sleep definitely plays a huge role. And I think, you know, what you, you've been talking about is just eating better. I think has a huge role. And I think also what we did was definitely switch to low GI. Um, you know, we, we used to eat lots of bread and we actually almost cut it down completely, you know, to low GI. Now mm-hmm. we just have to get the kids to follow suit and then you know, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> but the one has the one taste, the other one has the other taste. Yeah. It's yeah. a bit of ambition. Um, but yeah, it's quite cool. Um, I did find, you know, with our boy, he actually doesn't like red meat. I don't know. Like from the time okay. he was little, it's like, it's the weirdest thing. You know, you won't eat red meat. You'll eat fish and not even chicken, actually. So it's actually more plant-based. Um, the only Which red meat... 
Yeah, sorry. The only red meat he does have is McDonald's burgers, and I'm sure I shouldn't be telling a dietitian that, but uh, he does. <laughs> it's in moderation once a week. <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds perfectly in line with our guidance, actually, where we recommend red meat about two, max three times a week. We as Africans, one of our biggest downfalls in terms of cardiovascular health is the amount of red meat that we are consuming. And a lot of, um, over, of patients that, that have, have, have a lot of overseas exposure or lived overseas, that the one thing they will tell you when I ask about the differences, like where you lived in Germany, Versus now, what, what is the biggest change in your diet? And it will be the amount of red meat that I consume would be the first thing that I mention. Um, also, just link it to the blue zone concept. So blue, blue zones are areas in the world that have brilliant outcomes in terms of cardiovascular health, cancer health, aging. So some of these blue zones would be in the Mediterranean um, area, some in South America, some in South Pacific, and in your 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 Asian some Asian countries as well, and one of the baselines is more fish and chicken, less red meat. So again, a common denominator in all parts of the world with good um, lifestyle outcomes. You know, I must admit, I I do see how that makes a lot of sense. I mean, look, I, I grew up in Zim. Red meat was a you know, five, six times a week thing. And very definitely, if you were having a braai, there was a steak on a braai. But I've also found recently we've moved a lot more to kind of chicken, um, pork without the, you know, it, it took me a while to convince people that you could eat a pork chop without the crackling. Um Definitely do feel better, not as sluggish as when you're eating a lot more red meat. So mm. I can definitely see how that would play a role. And then, yeah, I mean, if you look at the Japanese, they literally eat fish and vegetables and they're well healthy when it comes to diet. So it does make a lot of sense that mm. just the accessibility of red meat can be an issue within a country. Yeah. So it's one of those things where nutrition can uh, we can make it extremely complicated, um, but we can also make it extremely simple, and that is and that's what I try to do in my group sessions, is just to get down to the basic foundations of what what do we actually know is true, and uh, and and what are some practical suggestions to apply it? Because yes, we can talk a lot about supplementation and the different supplements people use and the amount of money they spend on it, and 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 and, and all the different things you can do nutrition wise. But again, asking the question, what can I do for the rest of my life that is sustainable, while knowing that ninety five percent of diets fail? If a doctor would prescribe a medication that fails ninety five percent of the time, questions would be asked. So we as dietitians are prescribing strict meal plans that fail 95% of the time. Why are we doing that? So we must come from a different angle to make sustainable change. So, um, yeah, definitely agree with you on that. I love that point, actually. <laughs> That's actually a really good. Uh, the, the way you said that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, uh, because everyone goes, and you know, especially, I don't know if you remember this, but two or three years ago, uh, Discovery advocated, you know, that the, the dietitian visits quite a lot. And then I think they dropped that, you know, drastically, you know, it didn't count towards your points. And then if it doesn't count towards your points, people just don't do it. Uh, so Discovery kind of trained the market really well with that stuff. But, um, you know, I think everyone goes and gets these meal plans, but to be able to follow through with that was, I mean, it's always a challenge. And we had a podiatrist on uh, from Tutoria, um, and he said, and he said it really well, and I think this is the, the superpower that dietitians have. You almost know, you know, like you inherently know that if you eat this, you can't eat that. And he said, like, you know, you go to this braai and you have this and that and that. And he says, you, you, know, you can't do that. You know, you can choose, you know, have this or that, you know. And, and I think as humans, you know, and especially maybe South Africans, you know, we probably don't have that inherently built in us. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned the Mediterranean di diets and maybe people from those countries. I think maybe they do that inherently. Um, I don't know how they do that. You know, maybe they train differently or stuff like that. But I think that's the thing that we don't realize. You know, you can't have 
you know, like two starches. You know, you can choose one. You mm. can't have all of the protein. I mean, you have to get it like kind of balanced. Um, but I think dietitians do this really well. I think that's probably the one skill, you know, that if you could impart to, you know, everyone is probably the, the good one. Um, is how do you choose? And then obviously people are not going to follow it anyway, but uh, I think we can try. You're touching on one of my favorite things, which is the topic of mindfulness. And that's one thing that I try to convey is that mindfulness are for all areas of your life, especially nutrition. Because if you think about when you go to the movies and you have a bag of popcorn, can you remember what a popcorn tastes like, how it felt in your mouth, what flavor you used? You just sort of automatically just chew. And before you know that whole box of popcorn is gone without you actually experiencing it. And uh, there is a comparison study in South, Af- in, in, in South Africa. We spent 37 minutes eating a day. In France, they spent one and a half hours. So we are busy eating our sandwich on the end one on our way to work. We are eating well at meetings. We are not mindfully consuming our food. And we are seeing it in the health outcomes um, that, that, that we are presented with um, today. So that's one thing I, I really work um, as well from a digestive point of view. Um, if you experience bloating or indigestion, just slowing your eating tempo and really mindfully consuming really benefits a lot. And it's one of those simple things that one can do, but is really effective like sleep that you've mentioned. You know, I absolutely love that you said that, that you, in South Africa, you know, sitting down or having a meal isn't an event. You know, you're not mindful of it. And as you say, you, know, you sit down, you eat, quickly wolf down whatever you're eating in front of the TV or in between meetings or in the car on the way to work. Whereas if you look at some of the blue label countries you mentioned, so if you look at the Mediterranean, one of the big things there, if you, you know, Italy, you sit down, a meal is an event. It's everybody comes together and you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you take an hour to have a meal. And that has to, like you say, definitely play a role because from my experience or in my opinion, the more active, and when I say active, the busier you are, the faster you're eating your food, so you're not actually either chewing it properly or whatnot, which could cause digestive issues, but because you're always on the move and so on, then that leads to you don't sleep, which leads to fatigue, which leads to I don't actually feel like cooking, which leads to ordering Burger King or KFC for dinner. So it all has that knock-on effect, but if you just slow down, which is exactly what the psychologist we chatted to last week about burnout was saying is sometimes it's just being mindful of slowing down, assessing the situation and taking time. Yeah. I think we should go back to sitting at a dining room table and having meals as a family that takes an hour and a half. Mm. But yeah, I must admit it's one thing I picked up coming to South Africa is that a meal is like you eat, you get up and you go. Mm. Um, so, so the two sayings I have, and I picked this up with uh, many of the dietitian clients that we had, and obviously a few consults. And the first one I, I thought was was interesting the first time I heard it, which was empty calories. You know, we keep on adding these things, and it actually doesn't make any difference to the overall meal. And I thought that nah, that's actually quite an interesting, uh, you know, concept. Uh, and again, this is like one of those superpowers that you know dietitians just inherently have. The rest of us need to catch up very quickly. Um, and then the other one I thought was uh, the one where uh, making calories count. So, you know, if you're going to put something in you know, and eat something, you better make sure it's like the best that you can, you know, obviously budget, mm-hmm. budgetary constraints in mind. But, you know, make it count. You know, like what you just said about the popcorn. You know, just don't have the popcorn just because there's the popcorn there. You know, is it like, you know, is it really what you want to be, you know, eating? And I think those two things. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, in terms of the empty calories or the making the calories count? Absolutely. We speak about malnourishment in the face of plenty. So although you might be getting your carbs, proteins and fats, you might be completely micronutrient deficient. And we are seeing it more and more in the Western world. Um, So definitely um, 
And when you open up a magazine, you will have an article on how to cut down carbs, how to add more protein. COVID changed this a little bit, but now you would you would open up a magazine and read how important magnesium is, for example. So I spend a lot of time talking about micronutrients instead of macronutrients only, because um, the the building blocks of our cells is actually just as important as just where we get our calories from. Um, and I think just a, a, com a final comment about calories is is that under eating can be just as detrimental to your metabolism and to your functioning than overeating. So that's also a concept that might sound very strange on the ear for some because if I'm overweight, the solution must be to eat less. If each overweight person just ate less and exercise, I promise you we would not have had an uh, 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 issue. If it, it is multifactorial. It's like a puzzle that you build. So me as a dietitian, I work on the nutrition piece of the puzzle, but it's sleep, it's hormones, it's gut health, it's genetics. It's all of these factors. And a lot of patients are very hard on themselves and use the word self-discipline. I like self-discipline a lot. And one must not moralize nutrition. You cannot be a bad person or a good person um, because of the food you eat. And I think that's unfortunately the message that is uh, conveyed a lot um, to, especially in the social media space. Um, so I work a lot on that, just saying, let's let's detach the moralization process and just um, get back to the simple building blocks for you. And that often helps a lot. Also, one of my strategies would be to focus on one meal time at a time. What I mean with that is that let's say lunch is a problem. Like you always get a takeaway for lunch. It's the busiest time of the day. Then I would say for the next week, focus only on the quality of your lunches. Literally, Focus on that. Okay, now you've got that down. Next week, you have a look at the suppers. And before you know, by the end of the month, you've implemented changes that work and that are sustainable. So if it, if a whole lifestyle change seems overwhelming, which it obviously will be if you are suffering from depression at this stage, taking it one meal time at a time tends to work really, really well for some. I love that. And actually, that's a new saying. You know, like the, the thing we're picking up with the various practitioners we're getting on the, sh on the show is how there's like certain sayings that they have. And I love the fact that you said we shouldn't moralize or, you know, like uh, nutrition, um, which is actually quite cool. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's like about the demonizing of people, you know, just by looking at them. And I think that's, uh, you know, that definitely something we shouldn't do. I was interested in the point that you made, and maybe we covered it, but I missed it. But micronutrients versus macronutrients, can you like just go through that for us? Brilliant. Macronutrients. So when you think about when people say the calories that you eat, they are referring to the amount of energy that you consume per day that is used by the body. So that will include carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. So that's the three main food groups that will contribute to that. Um, one gram of carbs and protein will give you 17 kilojoules. One gram of fat will give you 38. Then when it comes to the micronutrients, that includes vitamins, minerals, and then obviously things like um, organic acids um, as well. Um, but th those will be the two main categories of nutrients that, that we used um, to explain. Mm, okay. I'm glad I asked that question. I don't think I knew it like that, which is actually yeah. pretty cool. Um, and then we spoke about the Mediterranean diet, but I mean, like, you know, what we know about the Italians and, you know, like most of the diet, maybe even the Japanese culture, is that there's always alcohol with it. Is that, is that a requirement as well? <laughs> it definitely can, can, can be part of, of, of a balanced lifestyle. And I always refer to the 80 20 principle. Um, 80% trying to, you know, stick to the guidelines that we are chatting with and 20% making it sustainable for yourself. Be it that once a week, date night with your partner, where you have a piece of pizza. And uh, when it comes to alcohol, the one that will contribute the most to weight gain would be beer due to a variety of reasons, one being purely carb content. Looking at um, great options would be dry red wine, um, your um, sugar-free gin and tonic, um, your whiskies. That being said, remember a lot of these um, medications that we are working with in the psychiatric setting is totally contraindicated with alcohol. And it also depends on the relationship. 
uh, the person has with alcohol, and in my setting, a lot of people do struggle with alcoholism. So my conversation is normally like, okay, this is the nutritional fact, but please have this conversation with your psychologist and psychiatrist, because I'm actually not qualified in the setting to say you are allowed three to four glasses if I don't know the background um, of your relationship with alcohol and the medication that you are using. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Yeah, yeah, that's actually really cool. Uh, yeah, because it's like mixed, you know, signals with that. I think because I do know. I mean, like you know, with those diets comes the, as you said, the red wine uh, or the sake or something like that. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, in terms of um, in terms of a vitamin tablet or something, do you advocate some? You know, do you advocate that people normally would would um, should look at something like that too, you know, because there's lots of people that say, you know, because we never get everything we need in, in a day, you almost like need to supplement. And that's why I suppose it's vitamin supplement. Uh, but do you, do you, um, is that something that you, you would say as well? So, um, we as dietitians are always try to say food first. Um, so in, in the specific, um, psychiatric setting that, that I'm involved with, a lot of my clients will literally eat like one chocolate bar a day. So before uh, we we work um, towards a more balanced diet, I would, for example, prescribe a multivitamin because that can actually help with appetite as well. We know low vitamin B12 um, levels, for example, can actually decrease appetite, but you can move towards a more balanced approach. So a lot of times I uh, do recommend uh, a good multivitamin as well as a vitamin D supplement, obviously related to blood tests, that we see. I recommend a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. We already touched on affordability issues, etc. So um, for a lot of them, that's a bit more practical. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's basically the, the three things um, that, that I check immediately. I have an obviously as well, but I like to work um, from, a, from an evidence-based point of view. I would like to see blood tests, low iron levels, prescribed iron, um, if, if you, you can't improve what you don't test, so I'm a big fan of knowing where my patients are nutritionally, seeing better outcomes, and we don't do that enough in private practice, um, especially as a dietitian working on your own. Um, to, but it really needs you need to go from like a blood um, test level and and decide from there what supplement is really indicated and what not. And often, those supplements people are using are working against each other. Um, I always sort of declutter and see, okay, but how can we simplify this if you only buy one or two options, um, for example? I think you touched on something very, very important there, Carla, is the concept of <clears throat> actually getting down to the blood or the DNA level and saying, because... The natural instinct is, and I mean, I know every month I go to Dischem and it's a probiotic, it's vitamin C, it's omega-3s, it, and yeah, because it's, it's, be, it's become habit, but it makes mm -hmm. sense. If you break it down from a blood level, you could see, okay, so there is a potassium deficiency or, you know, you've got a bit too much of this, so we need to stop eating four oranges a day and rather eat two bananas kind of case. So it, it does make sense. Um, and I know that with a lot of psychiatrists, because of the meds, they reckon they send patients quite regularly for blood tests. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting from a dietitian state that you say, you know, it's not something that's done often in a private practice setting. Do you know why that could possibly be? Yeah. Um Obviously, a lot of dietitians may work closely with a few physicians or GPs, and then it's quite easy. Um, you have a good relationship with um, with your with your team, and then, like for example, with the community the psychiatrist, I will go to the psychiatrist and say, "Listen, I'm interested in the vitamin D levels. Can you just add that to the to the blood test, or do you agree that it needs to be tested? Uh, yes or no?" Um, so, a lot of dietitians work a bit in isolation, maybe. Um, um, not really closely with, with doctors, perhaps. And then um, you don't always have that follow-up. I just see it with a lot of um, other dietitians, how they work, is that they will sort of work on their own little island 
um, and not follow up on that. And also the medical aid does not always pay for blood tests referred by dietitians, but it does for when it's referred to by a doctors or physicians. So you need that script. Um, although you can obviously recommend it if the patient is willing to pay for themselves, it's perfectly fine and you can order blood work, but for it to be get approved by the medical aid, um, it, it, it's a bit more of a tedious process. Hmm. I'm actually a firm believer on that part, which is I think we should get much more blood work done so we know, you know, as you said, evidence-based. And I think people don't pay as much attention to that. I think only when there's a problem, then we're going for all of these this blood work. But we don't really use it as a diagnosis tool, you know, as in, you know, what's really, you know, what do I really need to get, which is what Chaz just said now. And I think what you said as well, which uh, I really like. Um, so there's only one more question I have uh, I can think of, and then we'll ask Chaz and uh, we obviously want to be mindful of your time, so we'll we'll wrap it up just now. But um, I don't know if we covered the self-image part as much, but do you find that there's a real correlation between the self-image, um, you know, once someone gets their nutrition right uh, and their mental health, uh, yeah, mental health? Um, and I suppose, I mean, it should be intuitive, but I, I would love to get your thoughts around that. Do you find that when someone gets their nutrition right, that it like magically it just gets better. Yeah, I think like everyone, we build confidence when we master um, a, a specific area in our lives. Like maybe you were afraid to drive and now you are driving confidently and it makes you confident in all areas of your life because you've overcame this difficult thing. So if nutrition is a challenge for you and you sort of go on this journey and, and take the steps and do the and do the work to, to get to a place where you do have a more balanced relationship with food that does provide you with a, with confidence in yourself and you look at yourself differently, definitely. Um, and, and, um, I think all, and, and it's, and it's interesting coming back to the concept of BMI. We know BMI is such a poor indicator of health. Um, so we, 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 I always try to get it out of the way first and say, what are my non-scale wins? Because you get scale wins, which is the cages that you see dropping on the scale, but you also get things like better digestion, better sleep, better mood, better skin. So that's also something that I think not a lot of um, patients focus enough on. And I always draw the, their attention by asking them, okay, so what improves um, f from that perspective? So that also builds a lot of confidence and continuation with, with the process. Would you please go and tell Discovery that as well? The, the part about the BMI. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they yeah. definitely demonize that BMI thing. <laughs> to the point where yeah. I, I, I wonder, you know, like how many people are within that range, you know, that they mentioned because, yeah, sometimes it's pretty interesting, um, you know, how that works. Um, Shares on your side, is there anything that we should have asked Carla that we didn't? Um, before that one, just quickly on the discovery one, even with the blood pressure, you know, if you are normal is um, 120 over 80 or something, if you're 121 over 79, you, you don't get your points. Something's mm. wrong. Your blood pressure is too high or too low. So I think it is very demonized. Um, but just from like coming back to Carla, I know that nutrition plays a very big role in a lot of things, especially mental health and that kind of stuff. Um, we were chatting a while back with a podiatrist and he was saying that, you know, an illness like diabetes, much like depression or that kind of thing can be very, very difficult to manage. And obviously with that, then comes the whole self image side of things where you're not eating right, which exacerbates the diabetes. Um, what would you recommend for somebody who is maybe diabetic and kind of in that sort of feeling a bit depressed stage to get them back onto that level of, you know, you can't do the, you're going to sit and drink six Cokes and we're going to be cutting your left foot off next week kind of case. Hmm. Yeah. So I think the sentence, and I write it on top of my meal plan is do what you can with what you can when you when you can. And I, I think this is a this is really, really important because moving away from all or nothing, either everything should be perfect or everything is horrible. Um 
that sort of weekday, weekend pattern. Weekdays, Carla, I'm eating perfectly. Weekends is a completely different story. You want to move out of that type of mindset. You want to truly get balance. And um, I think sometimes it helps just taking a little bit of the pressure off by just saying, okay, what can I do in the in in in, in the next at the next meal? What can I do now? Um, and then asking yourself that question again when you wake up. Um, it, 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 there's no one size fits all solution to anything um, in this life, unfortunately. But I think just viewing it, viewing yourself as important enough to give attention to this, because what we see is a lot of people, they just go on autopilot or they are, a mom will pack a perfect lunch box for her kid, but she herself will grab like um, a high sugary option because she don't have time to prepare a proper breakfast for herself. Why? Are you also not on your priority list? And self-care is not saying me above others. It's just saying me too. So I want to encourage everyone to say me too. You have some amazing sayings, eh? And uh, she has, I think we should actually use that, you know, in terms of, you know, how we promote some of the content. Because, uh, I mean, I'm really loving, you know, some of the sayings that you have. Uh, and uh, I like that part about self-care as well. Uh, me too. Uh, you know, the one that I have is, uh, you know, when you go on the plane and they give you that instruction stuff and they always tell you, you know, you need to put the life jacket on for you first or else you can't help someone else. And that's kind of the thing for me is always say, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't sort yourself out first, I mean, how are you going to help all of your loved ones? Because you can't. But I think also mm-hmm. what you're saying is that, you know, everyone helps everyone else out and then you, you know, pretty much perish um, by doing that, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, well, not cool, but uh, it's pretty cool that you can mention that. Um, Carla, on your side, is there anything that we should have asked you that we didn't and you thought around this topic uh, that would really be useful? I actually think we, we, we have covered everything. It's a very interesting space in terms of research. I think we're only at the tip of the iceberg in what we know about how nutrition interacts with the brain. It's going to be very important. We know mental health is a big issue at the moment um, and very much related to the pandemic as well. There's been a, a 30% increase in depression and anxiety in South Africans from the pandemic. We've heard it yesterday again. So. Um, I think this is going to become more and more relevant and and important as um, time goes along, and, in, and it's a privilege to be in such a dynamic space. Hmm. I think on our side, we have to say, you know, thank you very much for agreeing, firstly, to come and share your wisdom with us, and then secondly, I think for the work that you do, and I'm really glad that you're in that clinical setting as well, because I think, you know, maybe, you know, like, I think people grow from that, and, you know, being exposed to that type of setting Helps. I mean, you you kind of collaborated that story with us by saying, you know, how important blood work is. And I think I I haven't heard many dietitians say that. And you know, maybe I haven't been close to them as much. But I love that. And uh, yeah. So thanks very much on both those fronts from our side. Thank you. It's been an absolute privilege. Thank you, Carla. It's been very very insightful. And especially some of those sayings. I'm definitely going to go home and use a few of those. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, stay tuned and we'll speak to you in the next episode.